be distributed to the smaller radio stations, such as Radio Luxembourg, who played it continuously, and then it got further afield to Radio 1, who did the same, and eventually the song did really well in the UK charts and got into the top ten, in fact got to number nine. And you'd think that would be the full story of the single, but no, there's more to it than that, because it wasn't just released as a single to do well in the charts, it was actually released to be the theme song to an Australian movie called The Man From Hong Kong. Jigsaw's song Sky High features in the opening and closing credits of the film, and the global success of that film gave them a worldwide hit. Here we have some original lobby cards from the similar release of the movie The Man From Hong Kong. And this is the opening scene where Jigsaw's song Sky High features at the beginning of the movie. Anybody knows the lunchbox? It used to be the lunchbox yeah, restaurant. The yeah, yeah, Mr. And he had he had um, Dan Pardon and a couple of them. They had a, a hit at the time. Yeah. Sorrow. The Sorrow. Like I know he knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> so then, what I did, I said to the, the he's give us a job, give us a word. So he heard they have a black singer, and he took us in. And then uh, what happened? They gave us some some jobs to play at the lunch. It was the lunch before the Coventry University, and we went down there. And I can't remember who the people I played with. But I think the second time was um, Long Down Poetry. Oh, um, right. Yes. And I played with them. And they came out to watch us because when we were, we heard, you know, we went on, did the first spot. And we'd go to do the second spot. They came out and started watching. So then he called Paul Price's father, who was handling us at the time. He called him in and said, Look, I'm having this, I'm taking this band from you. And he said, you can't. He said, no, we are, we are having it. And I'm going to book them because you don't know what you're doing. If, well, they sent me home. They, that's one thing. They, they sent me home and say, look, we can't have the king size kings. It's not, it's not a nice thing because we want something with a soul in it. Because you as a black singer and a soul singer, we want something with soul. So they sent me home back and said, come back. With, with um, a different name, with what name? Because we can't choose a name for you, so you must get one. So what I did, I went home, and the whole night, I just sit down. It wasn't the name I was concerned about. It's the way I can write the autograph. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that look nice. <laughs> so the first thing, hello, oh, hi. Okay. Yeah. The first thing that came in my thinking is King. Okay, leave the king, because they are the king size kings. And I say, king, but what is to go before it? And I start writing it. And suddenly I just make an a R, and I say, Ray, king, yeah. And I like, Ray King Soul Band. 1973 was when Silverton Hutchinson, uh, who I grew up with in Fosal in the 50s and 60s, well, more like the 60s, um, we met again, and uh, since we'd been childhood friends, he'd learned how to play the drums and I'd learned how to play the guitar. And he invited me down to a place in Hollyhead Road, on the, uh, inside the Ring Road, where it was called the Hollyhead Youth Club, or Youth Centre. And there was a basement. I ended up down in this basement with uh, Charlie Anderson, Gaps Hendrickson, Silverton Hutchinson, of course, who, who invited me down there. Desmond Brown, uh, Kami Amana, I think, came later. Uh, there were several other guys as well who were jamming. But they were the main guys, uh, H, of course, later, and Linval. They came up from Gloucester during that period too. Uh, Raking, a whole bunch of people who were so, so important for all everything that happened afterwards. And meeting Ray King gave me the idea to um, to try and form a band with Ray King that was, um, in my mind, could be one of Coventry's top bands, I know, just because he was such an amazing performer and great singer. And he had this uh, legacy of being 
uh, the Raking Soul Band and, and having made a, a, a really cult album, Raking Soul Band, live at the Playboy Club, a live album. So I talked to Ray King about forming a band and getting some of the best musicians that we could find in Coventry. And uh, that plan didn't quite work out <laughs> to, to that kind of template. Um, I ended up joining uh, the band that he had already. But eventually, because we only had guitar, bass and drums and Ray singing, we all started to feel we needed another instrument in the lineup. And uh, it was either going to be another guitar player again, or my preference would be to try and find a keyboard player. Now in those days, keyboard players who could play the kind of music that we wanted to play were very rare. Uh, it, it was very, you know, we, we talked and, and hoped, and then all of a sudden a mutual friend invited Jerry Damas to come to the rehearsal, and that's where I first met Jerry. And uh, as soon as he started playing, it was obvious it was going to work really well. There was a soul band circuit in Coventry, um, which was obviously a long time before punk rock, Ray King, um, Night Train, uh, so we, which was, you know, Limbaugh Golding, Silverton Hutchinson, um, H. Bembridge, Neil Davis and Jerry Dammer. So th there was this big melange of sort of black guys and white guys all playing dance music together. When we split up, it was the middle of 1976 and already punk was already uh, making uh, its its waves, and we were becoming aware of it. And what we've been doing with with the, with the band in with Ray King was more um, more pop and disco and, and and kind of old soul tunes. I said to them, let's bring in some scare music. <laughs> well, I don't think they knew much about ska, but they did their rehearsing. They were, they did they did um the. Well, not rehearsing, they did the um, investigation to find out more about it, etc. We, we did try to do a bit of reggae as well, No Woman No, no Cry was in the set. Um, but that was quite different to punk, and uh, we were both interested, Jerry and I, and, and we tried to, at that point, think about, let's, let's start writing, we'd already got our own songs, we'd already started writing songs from years before, and we, but we both said, let's start working on our own songs. Myself and Jerry and Neil, we came back and the two Smith brothers came back and Jerry said, those guys are not starting. I said, but they know, they know, because they know Ska better than I do, because they're from Jamaica and Ska was originated in Jamaica. So I said, they know it and they might be able to play it, said, he said. Nah, you can get it. You can do it your way. You can have your, you know. So he said, all right, so. He said, why don't you get rid of them? I said, no, what are you going to bring in? Well, they had, Linval, I, I know, was, was, was around. But Linval don't play bass. And we wanted a drummer. And Silverton was a bit moody at the time. And he said, nah, 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 and then, the conversation was ceased. We went up to rehearse and only myself and the Smith brothers turned up. <laughs> Neil and I um, think they didn't turn up. But Neil was saying he was waiting for Jerry to pick him up or something or they were getting a lick or something. And then somebody said, they start practicing. Punk rock was what was happening. Um, the Sex Pistols and The Clash very famously played at the Lanch um, one Monday evening uh, in early 1977. Um, I know this because the, the show band that I was in uh, was playing at the Smithfield Hotel just around the corner the same night and um, as I was walking down to the Smithfield I saw all these strange people um, loading stuff in and thought mm, okay they went off and did my gig and then afterwards walked back home and um, saw them all loading out and sort of milling around and thinking mm, something interesting might have happened there but that was that was the equivalent of the Sex Pistols playing the Free Trade Hall if you like you know the, the people who were at the, the few people who were at that gig you know went off and formed you know Squad you know and, and Radio Radiation the Wild Boys and, and all that sort, sort of stuff um, so punk rock was happening um, and loads of people who could barely play guitar, it gave them the sort of 
the courage or the sort of the, the reason to go and form a group. And they did. And you could go um, into Coventry four nights a week and see a group. They might have been absolutely awful, but it, a scene developed very quickly. The Flies were the first Coventry punk band to get a record deal. They signed to EMI and they released that uh, uh, Waikiki Beach ref Refugees. I mean, they used to be called Indian Summer. No, not they used to be called Midnight Circus. And, and they were this really good funk band. And then all of a sudden, you know, they had the tea, they had the safety pins in their old school blazers and, and they, they jumped up and down as they played, when they played and had songs with board in the title. And, and they were instantly this, this, this punk band. But they were really good. I had no interest in music. That's how it started. My brother, he was the musician in the family, Neil O'Connor. And he was in a band called The Flies. Yeah, The Flies are actually what inspired Homicide. Um, I went down to see them at La Hambra, I think, at La Hambra, I think it was called La Hambra. And uh, they were the first punk band I ever saw. And from that moment, I cut my hair off and was going to be uh, in a band. There was Roddy, who I remember seeing at um, Warwick University when the New York Dolls played there in 1974. Him and Steve Connolly, rodent were there in sort of teddy boy jackets and whatever and I was there in sort of flare jeans and cheesecloth and sort of salt shoulder length hair. Um, but, um, but sort of, and I remember seeing him around town with sort of vivid um, ginger hair and Doc Martins and thinking who is this bloke. Um, so they had their band, Roddy Radiation and the Wild Boys and of course Squad who were fantastic but absolutely brilliant. That was uh, Sam McNulty, Scully, Billy Little and Terry Hall. Uh, singing and, and they, they were great and I saw them oh, four or five times. Well the comedy music scene in the late 70s when I first started going to gigs uh, was like very exciting uh, with the groups like the Sex Pistols and the Clash were playing in Coventry um, you know it was a great sort of feeling at the time the specials were just starting out as the automatics um, I used to go and see them at Mr George's Club um, you know it was a great a great sort of feeling to be a punk and to be part of something that was a new and original and exciting. Punk was a big thing, a new thing for a certain amount of people, not as many as would claim it was now, but pretty much, you know, every band came to Coventry to, to play. It was on the circuit, we had decent venues, um, so it was, it was really vibrant and you could you could get, I mean, if you didn't mind taking your life in your hands, you could go and see The Clash, or you could go and see The Sex Pistols, and uh, that, to me, you know, I took my life in my hands. <laughs> Got chased home a few times, because um, it was a bit more of a dangerous time back then, with all the, there was a lot of gang culture with teddy boys and bikers, and skinheads were kind of starting up again. Um, went to a Chinese takeaway, didn't we? Where you were promptly dragged out and beaten almost to death. That was in Lamington. Yeah, in Lamington. There's like a bunch. It was quite dangerous to be a punk back then, you know, especially in provincial towns. And uh, yeah, a bunch of guys sat on him and damn near kicked him to death. So we didn't get to do. That was a, that was a cheerful little story. <laughs> <laughs> I had 14 stitches. They were pushing me around, going, "Only in the UK, is it? Only in the UK?" <laughs> Lamington had its own little scene. Though the sofas. My my wife was in a band called Flack Off. Um, yeah, the sofa records. That's right, and the shapes. Of course, for, for, you know they, they, they played with us a couple of times. Um, we released uh, an EP called Part of the Furniture EP, which was picked up by John Peel, and he gave us a session. And suddenly we were the biggest band in Leamington, which was great. But it was a big, exciting time for me, and a lot of other people. And it was really inspiring as well. So you could go out, like I say, most weeks there'd be someone on. And then that start that kick started a whole load of local bands to the same way that the Sex Pistols inspired, you know, half the Manchester bands that came after them. That they 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 did the same here really. They, they did the same in most cities. So it was, yeah, really important time. And it's what me got me into doing music. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now if it wasn't the one for those days. So local bands were beginning to mass and you could in much smaller venues, a lot of the pubs actually, bands would just get a little vocal PA and play in pubs around Coventry. Uh, we played most of the, quite a few of the smaller pubs, 
They were all playing uh, School Fates. Um, we played Zodiac. We played General Wolf. Um, there was opportunity to play on at Tiffany's on um, if one of the main bands allowed you to play. The first gig I ever went to, um, and that was the Stranglers in June 77 at um, Tiffany's. We were all in Leamington, and, but we used to come over to Coventry in the 1977s, 1977 to see bands at the Locarno. I think there was times when you could go out every night of the week and see a local band. Maybe one night was a, a national band, international. You got Iggy Pop or someone or the Remains. But it was, yeah, it was that was the big time. Coincidentally, when I was running my fanzine. When I saw all the music going on, I thought, I want to be in a band, you know, I had to be in a band. It was important, really, because I wanted to express myself, because this music actually expressed what I was feeling, like a, an angry teenager, you know, and I had to do it. But having zero talent in music whatsoever, um, I didn't do anything in 78. Um, and there, but then I saw that you didn't have to do music. There were independent labels springing up, and there were these things called fanzines where it wasn't you didn't have to rely on the NME and the national press. So people were doing photocopied uh, fanzines, magazines, whatever, just at home, going down and photocopying them. Sniffing glue was probably the most famous one in England. And I remember getting a copy of that. I think it was the last one, actually. I had a flexi disc of alternative TV. Um, and uh, that inspired me. Uh, and then I remember talking... It was talking with, with Dill from God's Toys, actually. And, you know, I really liked what they were doing. And we were saying one night, Oh, let's do a fanzine. Uh, Alternative Sounds was uh, a magazine, a fanzine that Mar Martin Bowes was putting together. I knew him at the time because we used to go to the same punk clubs and uh, I just sort of started helping him out. I didn't do a great deal, I did a few reviews and um, uh, uh, sort of helped him out, you know, with, with sort of suggestions for the magazine. Getting him involved. Got it kick started. There were other fanzines, you know, there was Sniffing Glue and, and famous sort of London fanzines, but there was nothing local in Coventry looking after the Coventry scene. So it was great, you know, to, to sort of be involved in something that, that was going to sort of sort that out. So I'd never done music, but I always did art. So I was like an art school dropout. Um, and so I did do a bit of graphics and design and things a bit at college. So that helped actually, because it gave me a little idea how to put a magazine together really. So I just, yeah, a lot of it handwritten, funny typewriter, a few photos, and I had a little Polaroid camera, so some of them were Polaroid pictures. Um, and then I went and photocopied it in, uh, it was Parbury's down in Albany Road in Earlsden, I remember. And we did a hundred, and it was, I think it was 30p. and. It was had to be that because it cost almost that to photocopy a hundred, but we sold them all. We, you know, went round uh, the old alternative shops like the Wedge, the old like left wing bookshop and cafe that is sadly missed actually, and the record shops because there was uh, Jill Hansen's and Virgin, the little old Virgin records. So I went and did that. Did a little my little distribution. Um, I don't think I got. I don't think it went out of Coventry. But I did the hundred, and then did another hundred. It was um, it was great to have somewhere that you, that could actually bring the bands together. But I think at the time everyone was going, uh, everyone was going to every gig anyway. So it was more like a, a catalogue of what happened at the time. And it, for me, it's a great reminder for those things that I'd forgotten about. So for the second issue. I remember I applied to the Prince of Wales Trust for a grant because they did things for young people because I love the royal family as everybody knows and uh, I wrote to them and uh, I got £100 um, 
to go towards doing it a bit better, getting it printed. Um, and so I actually went to, that was when I went to the Lanch, to the Poly, which is Cov Uni now, um, and to their print department because they did a little bit of outsource work if, if you did something that was a bit, they were quite left wing really back then, which is which I liked. Um, and I went down there and they printed it. So they did 500 because I think that was the minimum. So I had a few left of those. <laughs> but it still sold more. And with the contacts I got from the first, first edition, um, just people writing to me. And um, it meant I had some more people writing. Uh, so I had a bit more expanded reviews and people sending in things. I, 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 I'm not sure. I started to get the odd record as well, or cassette or something, and so it and photos submitted. So it started to grow. First, second one was still a bit embryonic, I'd say, from what I remember it, but um, it was a big step up from that um, that first one. Um, I used to put it around the shops on the first of the month, and then that day or the next day, I'd see loads of people with them rolled up walking around town. So that was really nice, you know, to get that like feedback. One thing I used to really look forward to as a, a not only as a musician, but as a fan of Coventry music, was uh, receiving the latest issue of Alternative Sounds. It acted to me as not only um, telling me what had happened in the Coventry scene, and indeed what was going to happen with gig listings, but it also told me about things that I was genuinely a part of, and that's its most significant factor. A youngster called Pete Chambers started writing for me. Um, I don't remember what issue. He might know. I don't know. He'll be there for in what if we could be trawling through it. We'll find the first thing he ever, the first music article he ever wrote. I think. So he got involved. Um, in fact, there was quite a few people. There was Alan Ryder and Phil Clark from Nuneaton, and they were all people that started their own fanzines. 